This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord with a great day to give God praise. On this Sunday, we'll have our sermon by our, one of our associate ministers, um, Minister Andre Kittles. Uh, we're excited for him as he is completing and will graduate uh, from uh, seminary uh, coming up in May. So we're excited for him. Uh, today's uh, message for him will be coming from a very familiar passage of scripture uh, connected to the prodigal's uh, son. So many wonderful lessons within inside of that story uh, that is shared there. And uh, the main caption is that we got to understand that we need to celebrate the son, celebrating the son. God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Truly, it's a blessing to be alive. It's a blessing to praise a living God. I'm going to ask if you stand to your feet, we can lift this roof off and praise because he is indeed worthy. Amen.
about y'all? Testing, one, two. And then it starts working. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but I heard them say, higher, he'll lift you up. Higher, he'll lift you up. I don't know anyone else out there who's gonna lift you up no matter the situation. So we need to think about just how good God has been to us and how good we are to have him in our lives. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us this morning. You woke us up this morning that you didn't have to do that, but we are here. The highways are busy, Lord. There's ambulances, there's police, but th that didn't stop us from getting here, Lord. There are people that are on their way. We pray for them, Lord. We pray that they get here safely. There are people in the virtual spaces. We pray for them, Lord. Just because they're not in a church doesn't mean they're not in your presence. Lord, we want to thank you for what you have done for us because sometimes it is insurmountable what you have done. There is so much that we could have, lived, that could have happened to us during this week, but all of a sudden we are here. Lord, during January, you were good to us. During February, you were good to us. During March, you were good to us. And now we are in April. And boy, do I have a spoiler for you. He's still going to be good. He's not going to stop being good. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. You are our comforter. When a brother needed a friend, you were there. When a father needed to talk to a son, you were there. When a mother was worrying about her daughter or her son, you were there. When a son needed his mother, you were there. Lord, it, I get choked up with emotion sometimes because I just can't imagine what my life would be without you. Lord, we thank you for your people. We thank you for the people in the church. We thank you for our pulpit, our choir, our congregation. But we know that we are just a body and a body is nothing without a head. And we have the best head in the business. We have Jesus. And in that, we can just say thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. morning, Southern. We are truly blessed to have another opportunity to come together to praise the matchless name of Jesus. So we invite our visitors, feel free to worship the Lord in this house. We want to start on a note of celebration. We have some birthdays. When I call your name, would you please stand so that we can greet you? Sister Willie Bell. <laughs> Brother Jimmy Tarver. Brother Eric Payne. If we've missed anyone, please accept our apologies and know that we wish you a happy birthday and many, many more. It is the first Sunday, which is not normally my Sunday, so I get to acknowledge those that are celebrating wedding anniversaries this month. Do we have any wedding anniversaries in the month of A? All right. How many years now, Natalie? 16. 16. <laughs> Miss, okay. <laughs> How many years? All right, amen. <laughs> we invite you to join us for Bible study on Wednesday at 6 p.m. where we will Tackle the topic of biblical foundations. Amen. On Saturday, there will be a special presentation here from Melissa Powers, who is the Hamilton County Prosecuting Attorney. She is presenting a program on how to prevent elder abuse. So there are those out there that love to take advantage of our elderly people. So if you have any elderly in your household or if you are elderly, 
come by and get some useful information. Amen. We remind you that there are three ways to give here in the sanctuary. You may give using the Givelify app, or you may mail your tithes in to 3556 Reading Road. We have not moved. Amen. <laughs> and finally, our thought for the week. When you turn your worries into worship, God will turn your battles into blessings. Amen. Have a blessed week.
have gospel groove on today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Jesus is an excellent name. The name of Jesus, every knee will bow. The name of Jesus, every tongue will confess. And for that reason, I can't stop praising. I won't stop praising. You can't make me stop praising because he's just been that good. And we lift his name on high today. We give praise to God for our music ministry. absence of our pastor, if, if you can oblige me real quick and just uh, praise God for our pastor, we can just give a hand clap of praise to God for our pastor, um, just the amount of work and, and effort and time that he put in to making this church better, to praising God's name, to equipping the saints to serve God. That is a work that we shouldn't take for granted, and it's a tedious work. I'm going to ask if you can stand to your feet and turn to a familiar text. If you got it, say, I got it. If you need time, look up to the screens, as the pastor will say, from which with your help. And it reads... To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed up all his belongings and moved to a distant land and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son, Please take me on as a hired servant, just a few more. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. The last one, for this son of mine was dead and now, and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party begins. You may be seated. I must say that we are a day before what millions of people would be out trying to encounter, experience what's happening with the sun out there. And there's going to be a lot of celebrating and partying and a big spectacular over this. But today, we will be celebrating the S-O-N. As Jesus moved through this chapter, 
he is placing greater and greater emphasis upon the value of things lost. This chapter or series of parables has often been called God's Lost and Found. This one is the most familiar and beloved of all of Christ's parables. But the question is, why did Jesus write these series of parables? I'm glad you asked. If we go back in the first verses of the chapters, they were prompted by the Pharisees. Jesus was prompted by the Pharisees and the scribes. Brother Ernie, the spiritual leaders, the religious leaders, not spiritual leaders, but religious leaders, they were complaining about who Jesus kept company with, who he was talking with, who he was being associated with. They were complaining that Jesus were com was taking company with sinners and the publicans. Verse 2 says they were complaining. They were murmuring. And as you know, murmuring is one of the major illnesses in the church. It destroys the church like a disease from the inside out. Murmuring by the church, by the religious leaders. They took offense because he was conversing with what they called heathen men, with the publicans, the tax cheats, people that they felt didn't deserve to be associated with Christ. But it isn't like he was chilling out, playing cards, drinking or whatever. Jesus was preaching to the heathens. He was preaching to the publicans. The religious leaders, Sister Roberta, were upset that the Messiah was preaching to the unsaved. They thought it was beneath Jesus to associate with these types of people. Repentance and salvation, they felt, was only awarded to the Jewish people. Uh, no one else deserved to see the kingdom of heaven but the Jewish people. They felt that if you were out in the streets, you weren't part of us. You don't deserve to hear the word of God. I'm here to tell you that if you want to be outreach driven, sometimes you have to go to where the fish are. If you want to be the light that God calls us to be, light shines best in the darkness. You have to go into the dark to illuminate the darkness. And last time I checked, the Bible says, can you say the Bible says that you are the light of the world. You, me, are the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. The spiritual leaders were upset that the spiritually sick was at the hospital seeking treatment from the good doctor. Now, I've been in a hospital a few times, unfortunately, and I never can recall other patients mad that I'm at the hospital seeking treatment. Instead, they are trying to seek treatment from them from the one that can give them a cure for whatever ailments they are suffering from. But this was the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, that was their excuse. But it was apparent they were trying to tack on more charges to bring against Jesus that they may have justification to execute him. So Jesus, with his good self, instead of getting angry, which he should have rightfully done, said, you know what, let me give you a couple of these stories to illustrate the point. The first one is the parable of the lost sheep. This parable, God is taking the initiative in seeking sinners. The rabbis taught that God would receive sinners who sought his forgiveness earnestly enough 
But here, God is the one seeking the sinner. Can I explain shepherds to you? Thank you. Shepherds in the Middle East were responsible for every sheep. Uh, the shepherd was obligated to his master to see that none of the sheep were lost, none of the sheep were injured, none was harmed or killed. It was his job to provide protection and to provide guidance, just like a good shepherd should. Shepherds provided nourishment for his sheep. So it's no surprise, as we read and hear, that the shepherd would go out of his way to search for one lost sheep, even if it was only 1% of the herd. The shepherd carried the sheep back home after retrieving it. That gives a picture of how loving the shepherd is for his sheep. That shows how much he cared for his sheep that he would carry him. We serve a good shepherd that says, you don't have to go through what you go through. Get upon my back and let me carry you through your trials and your tribulation. And once the sheep was brought home, everyone rejoiced, including the angels in heaven, once this lost sheep has returned home. But Jesus reiterates the point from the first parable with another one about a lost coin. Silver coins in this verse is the Greek word drachme. A drachme is worth the same as a Roman denarius, which could buy you 10 donkeys. Jesus says that even though it was only 10% that you lost, she searched high and low for that one coin. I remember, I know you can't tell by looking at me, but I, I, I like to eat, you know, I go to the, I go to the fast food. I, I know you can't tell, but I, I used to go to the fast food places and I remember going through the drive-thru, you know, ordering my food, paying my little bill, and somewhere during the transaction of money, I dropped a few coins, it had to be a few pennies. And, and I didn't care to pick them up. There's a few pennies, and the, the worker didn't care to come out and pick it up. You know, it was worthless to her, and it was worthless to me. However, we serve a good shepherd that no matter how unworthy we were before him, he thought enough of us that we didn't throw us away. He didn't cast us out. Instead, he searched high and low that we would come to know him and that we would have a better life. The Bible says the best we were were filthy rags, but he thought enough for us to not let us stay lost. When we get to verse 11, Jesus expresses his point even further. His point about rejoicing over repentance. Although the basic pattern before this parable remained the same, the seeker recovering the lost, the perspective changed. The primary character is not the seeker now. The primary character is the lost. It starts with an introduction of a man and his two sons. Verse 12 says the younger son told his father and I don't know where you just get the audacity that you tell your father, your mother, anything. But this son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. This boy who has nothing to his name, he doesn't have a pot to, yeah, he doesn't have a window to throw it out of. This boy who more than likely didn't pay a bill in his life, this boy who knows nothing about the world goes to his living father and asks for his inheritance for which he did not deserve. Now, Jewish culture says that the youngest son is entitled to a third of an inheritance, but the oldest son gets two-thirds of the inheritance. Deuteronomy 21.17 says he, the father, 
must recognize the rights of his older son, the son of the wife he does not love, by giving him a double portion. See, this verse was talking about if a man married a woman, you, you all know about Jacob and Leah and Rachel, in order to get to Rachel, he had to marry Leah first. And if that first wife has a son, even though you didn't love her, you love your second wife, that first son is due his inheritance. He is the first son of his father's virility, and the rights of the firstborn belongs to him. Now, it wasn't uncommon or illegal to ask for your inheritance before the, the father dies, but it was insensitive and it is cruel to ask for it while he's living. In other words, he was practically saying, I wish you were dead. I'd rather have your goods than have you. You are not worth more than what you have, and that's why I want it. And notice, he didn't ask, one, he didn't ask, he demanded, but two, he didn't say please. Now, yeah, I'm gonna pick on our youth nowadays. It, it, it seems the hardest words for them to say nowadays is please and thank you. And yeah, yeah, that's a bad thing, but uh, uh, if they ain't been taught that, they're not gonna do it. I just leave that out there. This son says, give me my inheritance in the, new, in the King James Version. Give is in the aorist tense, which means at some point, he said, without regards to past, present, and future, he said, give me my inheritance. But most interestingly, it was in the imperative mood. The imperative mood was a mood, it was a command. He commanded Give me what I want so that I can leave. <clears throat> yeah, and don't, don't look bad on him because sometimes we can do the same thing. We command God to send me that boy that I like. We command God to give me that job that I probably ain't qualified for, but I want it anyway. We command God for that car that I know I ain't got enough money to pay the insurance on. Sometimes we command. I, sp I spent a number of years in school. Give me that job. God works on his own timetable. He works on his own schedule. He doesn't report to anyone. The word says, I am God alone, and no one can tell me what to do. But this father, he, he was, said, okay, I, I'm going to give you what, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm, I'm going to oblige you and give you, give you what you want. So he divided his stuff between the sons. He said, okay, here you go. And the Bible says the boy packed all his belongings. This phrase meant that he liquidized his assets. He had some, some cattle, he had some, some farming things, and he liquidized it, he took his stuff, his pockets full of money, and he handed, headed to a distant country. Peace out, Dad. Pops, I'm gone. I'm out of here with the money that I don't deserve. And it barked on righteous, riotous living in the King James Version. Riotous living prefer, uh, is a phrase that prefers, when one prefers to live a life totally given over to sinfulness and wickedness. He took his little fortune and headed down to Hard Rock Casino and spent it up on red. Uh, he, he took the little money he had and headed south to Magic City and, 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 and you know, he, he spent it unwisely and, and, and he did other irresponsible things. Did he have fun? I'm sure he probably did. Uh, you know, uh, you, you got a little money in your pocket, you don't know what you're doing, you, you, you're gonna have a little fun. But for every mountaintop experience, there is an instant valley landing. Hebrews 11:25 says, the writer says that Moses chose to suffer the affliction of the people of God. He could have lived a lavish life. He, he could have lived, he, he could have had some change in his pocket when living with Pharaoh, but rather enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, he chose to do what God wanted him to do. 
NBA star, former NBA star legend, Allen Iverson, was one of the best point guards in the history of the game. At one time, he made $300 million. He had a $300 million contract, and, uh, and that's a lot of money, Brother Ernie. Uh, but he started spending it unwisely. He, he got all his boys together and put them on payroll. He paid a hefty a salary to somebody to carry his baggage for him. And uh, he, he went to places he shouldn't have gone, and soon he was dead broke. That's what happened when we choose to be irresponsible stewards. Eventually, this boy's money ran out. He was low on cash. He was destitute. But not only that, his friends ran out on him. Uh, you don't have no more. We, you can't, okay, well, we're going to go then. You know, have a good one. He found out too later that sin carries a high price. This happens to anyone who lets sin reign supreme in their life. It may feel good, it may look good, it may even smell good, but ultimately the author of sin is out to destroy you. The, the, the author of sin may promise you the world, but it can only deliver hopelessness, dissolution, and death. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But soon, this momentary pleasure turns into a lifetime of pain. At first, he was a dream. He was six foot. He was tall, dark, and lovely. He had chiseled abs. You know, he had the nice car, and he took me places, and, you know, treated me kindly. You know, he opened my door. But soon, before you know it, he turned into a Charles McCarter. You'll, you'll have to research that yourself. So this boy introduced, this boy finds himself in a destitute, friendless, and hungry situation. He's now feeding pigs for a Gentile farmer. Now I know that doesn't mean much to you, but this is the worst sort of derogation imaginable for Jesus' Jewish audience. Pigs were considered unclean, filthy, dirty animals that they are not even touched by Jews, according to Jewish law and culture. They considered this boy to be cursed. You have to resort to feeding pigs, to touch pigs. What did you do? But not only that, he considered eating the pods meant for the pigs to eat. Now, the pods were for a carob tree. It's sort of like a pea pod, but it had a sweet, chocolatey flavor. But it was indigestible to humans. Uh, not only that, had someone offered it to him, he would have eaten it. But no one offered a thing to him. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. And this boy who thought he knew it all said, I'm going to go out. And now he finds himself looking at the pig's food. This boy's entire time in a far country had become a time of insanity. Uh, had he been thinking clearly, it would have been different. Now the fog lifts and he remembers how good he had it when he was at home with his father. Sometimes our youth are so in a rush to leave home that they don't forget that Duke is going to come knocking at your door. They're going to forget that uh, uh, mobile home insurance is going to be knocking at your door. They're going to forget that that refrigerator was full, but now you're lucky to get a pack of ramen noodles, which I love, but you know, it's me. So he makes up his mind, says, you know what? You know, I had a good at home, and I know I done messed up, but it's better than being out here. Let, let, me, see, uh, let me see if I can go home. He, he longed for fellowship with his father. 
he, he wanted to go to a place, wanted to go back to a place where he is loved, where he is fed, where he was cared for, where he had privilege. He wanted to go back home. And even as he makes up his mind to go home, the, the, the thought occurred to him what he had done. He sees his own unworthiness and he is willing to go home under any circumstances. He wants to go back home to daddy. He wants to go to the father's house. He wants to go sleep in his own bed for once. You can see the change in what he says. He left home saying, give me, but now he wants to return home saying, make me. Before, he not want to understand the father's authority, but now he's willing to become an indentured servant. He's willing to, in essence, become a slave as long as I'm at home with my daddy. That is what it takes to go home. That is what he will do. I see a boy who is willing to confess his wrongs, repent his sins, and return to the Father. Any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied, is what he's thinking. So the son rushes home, ready to be in servant, but instead he is welcome with forgiveness. And there's three points I want to reiterate about this forgiveness. One, this forgiveness brings purity. Here, the son stands, the, here stands the son in the rage of his sins. He doesn't look like a child of his father. But the father orders the best robes. Said, bring, bring the robes. Bring the best robes and clean this man up. And, and this robe will cover all the stains and the dirt of the pig pen. Uh, uh, this robe will make him look more like his father because he wore his father's robe. Anyone who saw this boy dressed in his father's robe might have mistaken, is that, is that the father? No, that's the father. No, that's the son. I thought he left, but he looks like the father now. This robe erased all the visible signs of this boy's sinful past. Paul says that you have to put off anger. You have to put off wrath. You have to put off malice and blasphemy and filthy communications. You have to take all that off before you could clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, before you clothe yourself with kindness, before you clothe yourself with humility, gentleness, and patience, before you can clean up, you have to get rid of the stink of the past. Before you can shape up, you have to forget what you used to be. When you get rid of such a stench and you get cleaned up, you become more and more Christ-centered. But not only is this forgiveness brings purity, this forgiveness shows privilege. After the robe came the ring. The ring was a symbol of sonship. It was a symbol of authority. The one with the ring could speak for the father. The one with the ring had access to all that belonged to the father. The father with the, the one with the father's ring was in position of great privilege. When sinners repent of their sins and they come home, they are given the privilege of being recognized of his sons. First John 1, 3 and 1 says, see how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. They don't see who represents, who you represent, who's in you, because they look at what you used to be. They look at what you used to do, and they hold that against you. But the Bible says that anyone in Christ is a new creation. All that stuff I used to do, yes, I was guilty. All that stuff that I used to say, yes, I was guilty. All the places I went to uh, I used to go to, I was guilty. But now I'm a new creation. I'm someone new. I'm not what I used to be. I am someone that God says I'm worthy enough to surrender my life for. 
But not only that, they are given the privilege of speaking for the Father. Acts 1 and 8 says, but you and me have received power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, to Avondale, to Westchester, to Madisonville. He calls us to be his mouthpiece when we are his. But not only that, they're allowed access to all that belongs to the Father. Romans 8 and 17 says, and since we are his children, uh, there's, there's privileges in being in the family. Since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Uh, if you want a heavenly inheritance, there's some suffering that we got to do here. Oh, we may not be the most popular person. We may not be liked on the job. We may be called goody two-shoes, but in order to reign with him, you got to suffer with him. When we come to the Father, he opens the storehouse of grace and gives us everything he has. What a privilege it is to belong to those who go home to the Father. But not only if this forgiveness pure and privilege, this forgiveness denotes position. Uh, the Father calls for, uh, bring shoes to be brought for the feet for this son. My son's come home, let's bring him and put him on these shoes. Because only slaves walked around barefoot. Sons or daughters wore shoes. This boy returned home desiring to be a mere servant. He said, I, I would do whatever. I, I'd go and, and, and work in the, 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 the pig farm if you got here. I, would, I just wanted to be home. I would be a slave if you want me to. But the father is determined to recognize his position as a son. In the boy's eyes, he didn't even deserve to be anything, get anything from the father. But this father looked at him and said, this is my son. The father alone determines the position and the worth of his children. Sometimes people judge you by what you used to do, as I said, by used to act up. You can't be a child of God. You're not a child of God. You remember what you did back then? But uh, 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 they'll try to discredit your relationship with God. But God says, when you join me, there's no one that can pluck you out of my hands. You are my child, and I claim you. I never left you. You may have turned your back on me, but you're back home. You're my son. You're my daughter. Old things that you used to do, I forget them. I forgive them from the east to the west. It is erased from my mind because I love you that way. And I know I said, uh, thank you, Holy Spirit, that I had uh, three points. I got a fourth. Forgiveness is pressing. The father noticed his son from a distance. See, that, that looks like, is that him? And, and he ran up and kissed him. Now, in Jewish culture, it was considered undignified for a man to run. For some reason, men don't run. Take your time. Things should come to you. But why did his father run? The same reason that God runs to meet the sinner quickly and extend mercy and put away danger for this person coming home. He literally interposes himself between us and his wrath. 1 John 2 and 2 says, He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. In other words, things that we were guilty of, he's, uh, in the courtroom, he says, uh, Your Honor, charge that to my account. They're guilty. I didn't do it, but uh, put that on my account. Uh, this person did, you know what? I know he was guilty. Put that on my account. I don't want bad things to happen to my people. I don't want my people to suffer hell. I'm, I'm just going to take this L for them because I love them so much. It says he kissed the son. The verb kissed 
was in the present tense. In other words, he didn't just go up and kiss him and all. He kept kissing him. Kept it. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for not staying way longer. Thank you for returning. In spite of the smell, in spite of the filth, in spite of the hurt, in spite of the pain, in spite of the loss, the father still kissed the son. I love you, son. Don't matter what you did. I love you, son. I love you. Thank you for coming home. That was the ultimate sign of acceptance by the father. Uh, the father must have been worried sick before the reunion, but the arrival of the son eased his mind. The father must have had nights of arguments with the wife. Why did you drive my son away? But now the, re the, the, the arrival of the son eases marital tension. The, the father must have realized what a mistake he may have made by letting him go. But now he realized that with the arrival of the son, everything is made new. The, uh, 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 the, the arrival of the son ease away the gray hair that must have been growing in his head. And someone here must have been dealing with health issues, but the arrival of the sun erased all that hurt that you might be suffering in your body. Uh, someone here might have been dealing with financial issues, but the arrival of the sun know that everything is going to be okay. Someone here may have lost a job, but the arrival of the son makes you realize that he will take care of you in times of distress. Someone in here may have been having marital issues, but the arrival of the son eased all that turmoil that might be in your marriage. Someone in here may have a wayward child, but the arrival of the son says that I'm going to take care of him while he or she is out there. Someone in here might have been dealing with cancer, but the arrival of the son says I'm going to heal your body later on. Somebody in here may have had dealt with COVID, but God says the arrival of the son would take all that away because he alone can fix it. But not only that, with the arrival of the sun, creates a heavenly party. It creates celebration. When somebody who is out there comes back home, the church, the people of God, heaven rejoices and they have a Holy Ghost party because this person could have gone and been gone forever, but he returned home. And that's the kind of attitude we should have when somebody comes back to the family of God. We need to celebrate the son for the return of the son or daughter. That's our message, and there may be one here today. There may be someone who don't know Christ for the pardon of their sins. There may be someone here that's been out there trying to do it on their own and realize I need help from the Son because God is merciful, God is kind, God is forgiving. He says you don't have to be out there all alone. You come home with your family, with your father, and I'll make everything all right. That's why we celebrate the Son. He is good. He is merciful.